This is what Father can do for you in your heart. This is how he can keep you and free you from the world and the ways and the concerns and the frets and the schemes and the pursuits of men, godless, heathenistic men. He can make it to where your greatest desire, you talk about Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Look how much he's changed the desires of my heart. I used to want to be king of the world. Now I want to be a foot washer. Now I just want to be the guy at the back of the line who gets to say, I see him. I see him. He's there. Do you see him? I can see him. That is my desire. That is the delight of my heart. It is 8.42 in the morning on July 23rd, 2017. I've been driving this morning to my favorite walking trail next to the Tennessee River. And I just love the sound of the cicada bugs in the summertime when they come. I just love that sound. I hope you're not distracted by it. It's something I, reminds me of when I was a kid playing in the front yard at my grandmother's house. The 17 year cicada bug, they would come out and be so noisy and they're apparently around this year. So I, on my way here, was thinking about the topic of peace. And I just had been thanking the Father so much this morning for the peace that is in my heart by Jesus Christ and realizing how much He has kept me through. So many storms, so many adversities, so many difficulties, and yet I can look back and see that even in some of the most terrifying times where I took my eyes off of Him and His promises, and I slipped in my faith a little bit. Once I put my eyes back on Him through my spiritual disciplines and clinging to the Word of God and crying out to Him in prayer, I see that Father has kept a sea of glass, tranquility in my heart through so many of these difficulties. And peace is something that is so vital to the Christian life. It's something that is one of the richest blessings God can give us. And yet, it is one of the most MIA, missing in action, attributes of the Christian life. So I wanted to just share a little bit about what's on my heart as it relates to how we as Christ followers can find more peace. So the Bible says a lot of wonderful things about peace. And Jesus in John 14, 27 promised, he said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. The peace that the world gives is determined by circumstances. Even the darkest hearted heathen can experience peace if his circumstances are in order and things are going well in his life. And then when you take away those difficult circumstances, his heart becomes a reflection of those circumstances. I can think of the few bosses I had who their peace was determined by the stock ticker. Each day they watched the stock market and their peace, their happiness was determined and would correlate directly to the ups and downs of the stock market. That's an example of peace that comes from the world. Um, relationships. I used to have a peace that if my ex-wife was doing good, I was doing good. If she was doing bad, I was doing bad. She was my stock ticker. And so that's the way that the world gives peace. And this is not what God holds in store for His children. Praise be to the Father in heaven. There's a much, much better way. I testify to you that even in suffering, I now walk in a peace that is unlike anything I have ever imagined. That no matter what I may be experiencing in my body, physical pain, in my mind, torments, emotional, whatever it is, even spiritual oppression and torments from the devil, because he hates me so much, inside my heart, as the Tennessee River is a plate of glass this morning, so it is inside my heart. It is truly a gift. And in Isaiah 26, 3, I believe it is, God tells us that, and this is a promise that we can cash in the bank of heaven through faith, 
and humble dependence and obedience to God's words through Christ Jesus. He says, he will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in him. Now, one of the things I want to talk about is the not so obvious part of being steadfast. When we think of that verse, we have a tendency to think that means if I trust God in all things, everything's going to go well. That's absolutely true, but there's other parts of this that I see in my own life that I want to share with you that are principles that have contributed to the peace that I enjoy and I testify to on my YouTube channel. And that is, I live a very simple life. The word steadfast means unwavering, fixed, okay? It's something that is determined. It's not moving to the left or to the right. It's not e easily distracted and it's not easily taken off course. And this is one of the things that God has taught me how to do. And without a doubt, I want to make it clear that the only peace that we can count on is the peace that comes from God. I'm not, again, trying to tell you how you can work up some worldly peace. The real peace comes from the Lord Jesus Christ as a gift through our love of Him as evidenced by obedience to His words and our believing in faith that He has these good things for us. But there are principles that we can practice, ways of wisdom, ways of the Lord, that will help us supplement that peace that Jesus Christ gives us. I personally believe we're living in some of the most difficult times there ever has been to be a true follower of Jesus Christ. I believe um, there are so many more distractions and there are now 2,000 years worth of the devil's schemes. You know, the devil has been learning right along with the best of God's people, but he never goes to the grave. He's an eternal creature and he's continued to learn and compounded his knowledge of the vulnerabilities of humans for 2,000 years. None of this has been a surprise to God, but God prophesied to us about these terrible days that we're in. And the Bible calls these days the terrible days, the end days, that it will be terrible. And there's a thick darkness across the earth and upon the people. I believe that we are in, again, some of the most difficult times to be a Christ follower. And part of being a Christ follower is maintaining your peace. I thank God for the peace. I thank God, okay? I just received some really, really difficult news just a few weeks ago, and uh, immediately it hits like a bomb. It goes off, and then within just a, a few, let's just say a few hours, I had put my spiritual disciplines into practice. I ran to dwell in the shelter of the Most High God, my Abba. This is why strong faith in God is so important. Because no matter what happens in my life, I have learned the secret of running to Abba. I have learned that it is always available to me. He never fails me. That He is an ever-present help in times of trouble. That He is a strong tower and the righteous run into Him and are saved. That He is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in Him and I am helped. That He is my help. Surely it is God who sustains me. That I can seek His face and look to His strength always. I have found this to be absolute truth. More true than the concrete I'm walking on right now is the promises of God and the evidence of them and their reality in my life through multitudes of difficult circumstances. So God keeps me as I run to Him and employ these spiritual disciplines. But sticking with this idea of steadfast, steadfast in your trust in God, amen steadfast in your praying to Him and trusting in Him, amen. Steadfast in your obedience to His words to the best of your ability, assisted by His Holy Spirit, amen. Those are all steadfast. 
steadfast on the promises of God when you see circumstances in your life that completely contradict what God has told you, amen. That is part of living a life of faith. You have to believe God for what He has told you and what His Word has said. Okay? However, there's another part of this life that seeks to constantly derail us from the path of God. There are rabbit trails by the tens of thousands in this life that are designed to distract us. I tried to explain to Persis when we were still living in India last year. I said, sweetheart, you are not going to believe when I take you to a bookstore and I let you see the thousands of magazines that represent a unique idol, a false god that we in the Western world depend upon. I said, there are literally thousands of them. You will not believe it. So we have a bookstore here in Huntsville, Alabama called Books a Million. Perhaps you've there around the country, you've seen them other places. And they have one of the largest magazine racks I have ever seen in my entire life. I mean, they, they must have thousands of them. And I took her there and I took a video shot of it. And when you look at the magazine racks, you can see that there's every kind of idol and interest you could possibly imagine. Every single scheme, every single pleasure, every single recreation under the sun has been created either through the devil, the god of this world, or through the imaginations and pleasure-seeking mind of men. All things except God. Man wants to find everything he heart, his heart desires and all things outside of God. In fact, I'm on a trail right now where there's um, a, f a bunch of women that have just passed me running. There's nothing wrong with getting exercise. But I see some people out here on a regular basis and can hear some of the things they're talking about when they run by or when they ride their bikes. There are people that do this as a false god in their life. It's not just a matter of staying healthy. It is their thing, okay? One of the ways to peace is getting rid of anything that doesn't help you to become more like Jesus Christ or that distracts you away from the ways and thoughts and mind of God. My mind is fixed on Him all the time. I think about Father all the time. I, I, I woke up in the middle of the night last night having almost like been preaching to myself, listening to the Word of God just in my head and, and realized that psalm where David says, you know, even at night as I lay on my bed, my heart instructs me. And that is so true. And I see that that's the Holy Spirit in me. He's always, he's so envious. He's the, the Bible describes him as the spirit that God has placed in you, envies intensely. He's very jealous. So naturally, he gives peace to us when we keep our mind fixed on him and on the things that he is thinking upon. That's why the Bible says, set your mind on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of the throne of God, not on things below. For the things below, things are visible or temporary, and the things that we cannot see are eternal. This is why God warns us in His Word to tell us these things. And this is how we find that peace, is by keeping our mind and our hearts focused on Him. And I have made a commitment into my life. It wasn't something I had to struggle difficult to do to eliminate all these distractions in my life. I, I didn't want anything in my life that will take me away from my heart's desire. Imagine a new couple that have fallen in love, sitting together, eating dinner, and they're lost in each other's eyes, but every single time, you know, the waiter comes by, he takes too long to explain himself or the choices, and after a few minutes, the, the couple will find themselves being frustrated. They'll find themselves being distracted and you can notice sometimes the server will have to say, look, I'm really sorry to interrupt you guys and I can see you're really into an intent conversation. What's going on there is that that lover, that couple does not want to be distracted away from their heart's desire. The thing that is the most desirable to them is each other. They're in love. Neither of them wants the other to find projects or recreational activities or anything outside of spending time with them. Okay, the better illustration or the better point 
is to think about how this applies to our relationship with God. I have become, over the years, very, very protective of my heart. Proverbs 4.23, Above all things, guard your heart, for out of it flows the wellspring of life. If I allow a bunch of crazy movies or crazy music or crazy entertainments or whatever, all these things in the world, <clears throat> even the cares and concerns of the world, I will be worried, I will be weighed down with the anxieties of life. So the Bible tells me not to do this. It tells me to fix my mind and heart on all things above. It tells me, finally, brothers, whatever is excellent, whatever is noble, whatever is praiseworthy, whatever is good, whatever is righteous, whatever is holy, it tells me to think upon these things. So I don't watch the news as an example. When I lived in India last year, Obviously, with the presidential elections going on, I was curious uh, from India, you know, how things were going back in the United States. So I would watch the news and, and get it caught up. But pretty soon I would turn it off because I realized, you know, there is so much going on in the world that has nothing to do with me. And that does nothing but to cause me to fret or to be concerned or to weigh my mind and my heart down with things that I'm not interested in worrying about. They're problems that other people can worry about. God has not asked me to worry about or to concern myself with any of those things. And there's a wisdom in shutting down your mind and directing your thoughts towards away from the things that men are so fixated upon. This is why I do not use Facebook. I really got so perturbed. That's a, that's a, a weird word for saying disgusted. When I would see some of my same acquaintances and people posting the same old, political, tired, worn out causes and thoughts and fears and uh, causes of men. And it's like one day God just gave me the eyes to see this. Take a snapshot from five years earlier. Men were obsessing and, and uh, being driven to concern themselves with matters that they believed five years ago were so important, some crisis. Let's just say the 2008 credit crisis. And you can now, as a Christ follower, look back on that and say, what did it benefit me to be a part of and waste all of my time obsessing on Facebook or wherever you might have done about that 2008 credit crisis as you look back. When you look at the transgendered bathroom issue that happened in the United States not too long ago or the gay rights things or abortions and all those kind of things, how, what kind of a return on investment have you gotten by standing against, speaking out against all those things? There are a lot of people who believe that saying that says, in order for evil to prevail in the world, it's only necessary that man does nothing. Something like that. You've heard this saying before, okay? And while part of that may be true, it's not entirely scriptural. Particularly, it's completely unbiblical regarding the point that I'm making now. We think that it's a good thing and a godly thing to obsess and worry and fret over all the evils. I cannot believe this corporation is doing that. We must boycott them. I'm telling you, this stuff is so silly. When I hear people boycotting Target and boycott, this stuff is silly. This is not how God thinks. This is not, God is not surprised when pagans do what pagans do. God does not expect you to go buy your oranges from some place that worships God alone. If that were the case, the uh, <laughs> Jewish people living in Rome and many other cultures around the world now that are suppressed by heathenistic governments would not be able to have anything supplied to them. We're not to rebel against our government. We're not to rebel against a heathen business that does what sinners do. That's not the ways of God to get all bent out of shape. What God would have you get bent out of shape about is your own personal sin. That's what makes a lot more sense is, are you as concerned about your own ungodliness about your own sinfulness, about your own unfaithfulness, about your own 
half-hearted devotion to God, about your own hypocrisy. As you are, all the quote-unquote great evil causes to take up in the name of Jesus around the world, I'm telling you, my friend, there's no peace in that. Unless God himself has called you specifically to it, I would challenge you to think about your own life and all the time and energy you've spent thinking perhaps about some cause or some bellyache that you see in society. What have you gotten as a return on investment from all of those years of worrying and fretting? What about Amos 5.13, which could be wisdom applied to today? This seems to completely contradict the saying of men that says, all that is necessary for evil to prevail is for man to do nothing. Amos 5.13 says that the prudent man keeps quiet in such times, for the times are evil. Think about that. Amos 5.13 says, therefore the prudent man keeps quiet in such time, for the times are evil. Now this is God's word speaking through the prophet Amos by his Holy Spirit. Are we shall, shall we come along and say, oh no Lord, somebody had it figured out better than you. Actually, the prudent man makes a huge bunch of noise, stands up on the tallest platform with the loudest microphone and makes a huge stink. Because after all, Lord, if man doesn't say something and do something about the evils of man, if man doesn't boycott Disney because of the gays, if man doesn't boycott Target because of the transgendered issue, well, that's all that's necessary for evil to prevail. God laughs at the simple-mindedness of men who think that he doesn't know all of these things that are going on, that somehow or another he's not perfectly pleased to allow it to carry on, that somehow or another he didn't know and couldn't have seen, and he must be completely shocked. Now, let me be fair. I fret about people's ungodliness. I fret and get sometimes upset about disobedience. When people sin, it burns inside of me. Well, guess what? That's exactly what happened to the Apostle Paul, and I certainly don't want to try to be more holy than he was. That's a good thing. When I fret and concern myself, not to the point of losing control or losing my own peace, that has happened a few times, and the Lord has had to take me back to Psalm 37, 7 and to remind me, that the sovereign power of God is working all things together for his good and he's working out everything for his own ends and according to his good purpose. Romans 8, 28, Proverbs 16, 4, Ephesians 1, 11. It's crystal clear that I can rest in the sovereign hand of God, that he knows what he is doing. So nevertheless, like Paul, I burn. Why? My love, my care, my concern for other people in that way. So... The point I'm wanting to make is we, we should be more wise about the things that we worry about. Like the things that you're concerning yourself with in this world, are they things that God has asked you to concern yourself or are they things that perhaps you have cherry picked as a way to alleviate your conscience or to make you feel like you're doing something good in the world? Think of all the Catholics who go every single week and stand on the side of a sidewalk somewhere outside of an abortion clinic. I'm not saying God can't use that and hasn't done some good and hasn't saved some lives. But when you see the way they live, most of them, throughout the week, that standing on those sidewalks and saving a baby's life is not going to do anything to save their life because they're not standing on their own sidewalk boycotting their own murderous sin in their heart against God. Do you see the point? People fool themselves and they pick a cause outside of themselves thinking that somehow or another tackling a sin in the world absolves them of the sin that's in their heart. And it never will, my friend. You'd be better off to not do anything good in the world but to do what Jesus Christ said. And that is that if your hand or your eye or your foot cause you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have all of your appendages, both eyes, both hands, both feet, and to be thrown into eternal fire. He doesn't say it's better for you to pick some cause in the world to fret and worry about. He talks about first base, get right with God. Romans 5.1 To have peace with God through Christ Jesus. That is the first priority that we must have. So I, 
I stay away from all those things. I don't look at the problems that are going on in the world. That's not my concern. The Father made the world. The Father's in charge of it. I'm only responsible to fulfill my unique mission in the world. And so I find tremendous peace by focusing on only what Father has asked me to do. Many people have good ideas about what they think I should do or what a what would be a really great idea if I did this. Okay? There's no peace in that. I only have peace in doing what my Father has asked me to do. And there, this, is a, this is another one of those secrets. That's why Jesus can say, I have food to eat you know nothing about. And what he's referring to is doing the will of his Father in heaven. That's, Jesus Christ considers that to be real food. Real nourishment for his soul is to do his Father's will in heaven, not his own. Not to live his own life, his own way, uh, even doing good things in the name of the Father. He didn't do it. And I have to tell you, with God's help, I have been learning how to do this more and more and more over the last several years. God is showing me the beauty of desiring to do only His will and the suffering that is required in order to do it. Uh, One person I recently read, A.B. Earl, who had written that the highest, most sublime level of suffering is not the suffering of going through difficult persecution, but the highest level of suffering is the level of doing God's will no matter what the cost. That this is the level of suffering that pleases God the most. And when you do it, you suffer. Even Tozer said those who are the most obedient are those who are going to suffer the most. That's the way God has allowed it. Nobody suffered more than Jesus. Nobody was more obedient than him. Second only to Jesus is Paul. Nobody was more obedient than Paul, and nobody suffered more than Paul. It is the way it works, but they are kept by the peace and joy of God in that suffering. They do what God asks them to do. Okay? So... Every once in a while, I may find out what's going on in the world, but I find so much peace in being focused on the mission that God has given me. And I even find that if I have to do something that's an activity like work that draws me away from God. For example, if I'm even writing sometimes, just sitting there so intently thinking on a task or working on a video, trying to remember where this is at and find this and go get this. Those things can actually, if I go too long, can rob me of my peace and I have to bring my thoughts back to God because working for God is not the same thing as being in His presence. Now, He can be in your work and He gives me empowerment for the work, but I bring Him into everything I do through prayers. Oh, Abba, I'll sit in a coffee store, wherever I'm writing or in my office, and I say, oh, Abba, please step into this with me, Lord. I I need your help. Please grant me the grace and the strength in my body and my mind and my spirit today to do this work, and please don't be far from me. And after years of practicing this, I am never without the Lord. So I have peace no matter what I'm doing. If I was not being kept by God's peace, I would be an absolute train wreck. I've done a lot of hard work and a lot of jobs and businesses over my life. I've never worked this hard. And I've never had such a overwhelming, stressful position. You know, I used to say that the most stressful job I ever had was when I worked for United Parcel Service, UPS, when I was in college. And I would go to work at 4.30 in the morning, the belt would start. And I was loading the UPS trucks. And they start you off with one truck. And it sounds so simple, but it is the most stressful thing because what happens is this belt turns on and these packages start coming to you. And you're not the only truck. There's tons of trucks on this belt. And there's guys at the head of the belt that just keep throwing these packages. They don't stop. Off of a big 18-wheeler, they just keep throwing the packages one after another onto the belt. As these belts come down, the packages come with them And you have to look at the packages 
and recognize do they belong to your truck first of all so is it a package that you need to grab or let go then you have to look at the package and know where it goes on your truck by way of stop according to shelf and order of deliveries now you have a list of your addresses on the back but it's hundreds you can't just reference that the belt keeps moving so the packages keep coming they never stop they show no mercy and I used to get so stressed out what I would do is I'd grab a package and then I'd say okay I know that's mine but I don't know where it goes I'd have to set it on the back of the truck and then of course the supervisor would come along and say Mike get those packages up get those packages up because for safety regulations you're not allowed to leave any packages sitting outside the back of the truck so then once you do one truck they give you two so now you're looking at these packages you have to know not only if they're yours then you have to know and memorize which truck it goes on and where on the truck it goes called sort order i'm telling you it <laughs> it's so stressful for my brain for maybe other people they might be laughing if they've had this job for me it was a torment okay and packages would just pile up there was nothing i could do finally i learned a trick i learned to grab a package and run ahead and some of the other guys that were ahead of me on the belt they would let me run kind of behind them I'd start running ahead to look at the packages sooner instead of waiting them to just pass the small little portion of the belt that came by my truck okay it reminds me of I love Lucy years ago there was a television show I guess when I was a kid called I love Lucy and my mom would watch it I remember there was a scene it's very famous it's been in all kinds of movies where I love Lucy she's I think making chocolates or she's on a chocolate thing and the chocolates keep coming down and they start coming so fast she doesn't know what to do with them and so she starts putting them in her mouth and eating the ones that she can't get in the package fast enough and then she starts putting them inside of her shirt in the top of her shirt and she's loading up it's just one of the funniest scenes to me because that's exactly what it looked like for me working at UPS okay that was stressful but it's not anything compared to the human packages that God was going to send on a belt my way through this Relentless Heart ministry. When it first started, I was delighted. I was happy to have the job just like at UPS. But then when the reality of how hard it is to hear story after story, tragedy after tragedy, broken heart after broken heart, divorce after divorce, bankruptcy after bankruptcy, health issue after health issue, broken life after broken life, crash and burn faith after crash and burn faith, adulteries, sexual immoralities, all kinds of things. These things really broke me up and really hurt me. Hello, good morning. You got way ahead of mommy. <laughs> so anyhow, she I'm sorry, the, uh, there was just a little girl there. I was just trying to, she got way ahead of her mom and wanted to say hello. But this is now what I'm experiencing in Relentless Heart, but the packages really matter. And the destination is heaven or hell, not just somebody's front door. And so if I mess up here, it's a lot greater conflict than before. She did a great job not talking to strangers. I tried to, I tried to make her feel good. I said, you've left mommy way behind. <laughs> So, anyhow, I felt a higher level of stress in this position than I ever have. And, and here's the main point I want to make. There is no way I could do the hardest work I've ever done to carry all of the weight of thousands now. I mean thousands and thousands of stories like this from around the world. There's no way I can do this. There's no way I could keep the peace. So the fact that God is keeping me in peace is extraordinary. It's amazing. Oh, I have my moments where it weighs on me in the past and I've had to learn how to snuggle into Jesus more. I've had times, Persis will tell you, where I'm like, I just can't handle this anymore. I can't handle people constantly backing up their truck and dumping all their garbage on my yard. The Lord was teaching me how to rest and abide in Him more. And my friend, I tell you, the Lord has helped me so much I can't help all the people I'm just one guy Lord never asked me to do that okay but I'm helping a lot 
thanks to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and I'm doing my part. He's doing his part, which is by far the bigger part. But I'm doing my part by keeping my life simple. When other people want me to go and do things or go here, do that or what have you, I'm not interested in it. I, I, my, my parents sometimes see how hard I work and I don't think it makes sense to them. And um, I just kind of stay real quiet around them and, and they don't understand it all. And I just say, look, I, 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 I have it in me. I have to work this hard. I want to go home tired and worn out for my Lord. That's what I'm doing. And yet, I have such a peace and a joy. I need no one or nothing on this earth except for my Father. I need no circumstances except for my Father. If I have Him as my one great circumstance, I'm at peace, my friend. You can be at peace. But what are the things in your life that are taking you away from God? You know, being anxious for nothing but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, submitting your spiritual requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Let the peace of God rule and reign in your hearts. Is it there? Do you have this peace that surpasses understanding and that's keeping your heart and mind? You can have it through patience, humble, faithful, trusting obedience to God's Word. You don't have to be perfect. You have to be like a child. And God will keep you in perfect peace. But what are those things in the world that you're fretting over or putting energies on that Paul would say to you, hey, look, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for you as a Christ follower, but not everything is constructive. What are the things that you can see in your life that you're interested in that are not constructive spiritually in your life? You know, you might be really surprised if you got rid of some people or some things or some recreations or whatever it is, interests, Facebook followings, YouTube followings, for example, all this end time stuff, okay? If you need to work on your fear of the Lord, sure, maybe spend a few minutes watching a couple of end time videos, even I've suggested people go and read the book of Revelation if you've lost the fear of God. But if you have the fear of God, why in the world are you fretting about those kind of things? Why are you spending your time worrying about things that no man has right, I believe? I believe exactly what the angel told Daniel is still the case. I, this is, I have settled this in my heart before the Father. I do not believe any man living on this earth has the end times right. I have listened to some of the best of the best as far as men who actually live what they preach. I'm not talking about these jokers who study in times and that's all they do and they write books about it and make millions of dollars. Forget that baloney. That stuff is disgusting to me. I'm talking about men like Zach Poonin who live what they preach. And if you notice, most of these men put so little focus on this subject. You'd be hard-pressed to find messages on the end times that are so specific as what we find in YouTube videos today from any of the greats. You know why? They were busy winning souls. They were busy working for the kingdom of God, seeing Christ reproduced in the hearts of men and women through their ministry. They were wise enough, I believe just as I've been wise enough with the help of God, to recognize that these things have been sealed up until the time of the end. We're close, but the time of the end is not here yet. I believe it was uh, September of 2015, September 23rd of 2015. There was this huge, prophetic, monstrous, false noise working its way through a great part of the charismatic church that the earth and America and finances and all of that, something huge and horrible, even this Rabbi Khan guy, the Harbinger author was out telling everybody the end has come. And he and all these men were telling us that September 23rd, I don't think Khan put a date on it, but lots of other people did and said, September 23rd, this is it, man. Hollywood's had the signs on this forever. There's been all kinds of Illuminati signs. This is it. The end is coming and all this stuff. It was so taken seriously that there were a great number of churches that I witnessed, in fact, the old church I used to go to, started having survival meetings about how to survive. People 
um, including members of my own family and friends that I knew that went there, started preparing for the end of the world and started packing up food and supplies. And, and we're taking this very seriously. And every single conversation they were having was about this. And what was I doing? I made a recording that I think is still today on YouTube. And if not, I can't remember. I've had so many. But I made a recording that stated why the world was not going to end on September 23rd, 2015. Emphatically. Because I have promises from God for my life that completely contradict the false nonsense that comes out of charismania. And I have seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of things God has told me that were going to come true that came true. So why would I doubt what he has said about something later in my life? I knew the end wasn't coming. I have a promise from God that's related to something about the end of my life that I'm not going to share. So I knew, and this kind of gives a clue to people who want to know my thoughts on the end times. I do not believe it will happen in my lifetime based upon what God has spoken to me. I do not believe it will happen in my lifetime. And so we can keep this recording and see if I was right. I was right about September 23rd, 2015, and I'm right about September 23rd, 2017. I was right about September 23rd, 2016, when these yokels continued to move this date back. And I can absolutely assure you the world is not coming to an end on September 23rd, 2017. And you can listen to this recording again after that um, as evidence. This is foolishness. This is the scheming and the the... the just craziness of, of men and false teaching and, and getting distracted by things that have nothing to do with becoming more like Jesus Christ. This is how easily the devil schemes. So what was I doing when all these people were prepping? Okay? I was resting in the peace of the Lord. Yes, my heart has been broken over what I see happen in the world. You can't not see that the majority of people are going to hell and just be like, okay, that's fine. I mean, I've gotten to a place where I've accepted and I accept the sovereign election of God and I accept man's independent choice to reject God. I accept it. I don't like it, but I accept it. And I'm only focused on doing the work God's asked me to do. And so in those days, instead of watching all the videos, instead of going to uh, these end of times or, or survival courses that these people were going to, I just kept on in my Bible study, sitting in my little chair in the mornings and making my little recordings for people who were struggling with adulteries and affairs or trusting God or illness, just helping people that have basic personal spiritual needs, dirty feet that needed to be washed. That's all I was doing. Everybody else was packing up bags of rice and buying all this and buying all that. And I say, go for it. I serve a God. And here's what I told him. I serve a God who's able to bring water from a rock. I serve a God who's able to make bread fall from the sky. I serve a God who's able to take five loaves and two fish and feed upwards of 15 to 20,000 people. I'm not going to have to fret and worry about my future. I'm not going to waste one minute when I already know because of what God's word has told me, the world is not going to end on September 23rd, 2015. So my boast is that Father kept me in peace, but I had a choice. I could have chose to go along with these people. I mean, there was a lot of people believing this. Maybe you know some people. There was people who were starting to sell things and get ready to move out and get packed up. And I told them all, I'm like, all right, well, I think it's neat to learn about some of these survival things I'm hearing you guys talk about, but I'm not into it. I'm not interested. God has got me. And you know, when you say something like that, you look like the one who's naive and they pay people say, oh, you're going to be the one that's wanting some of my beans and rice when you're starving. No, maybe you'll be wanting some of my spiritual food when your regular food runs out. Who cares if I starve to death? I'm not going to starve to death spiritually. I would actually love to die and go home and be with the Lord. That's how you can know you're a true Christ follower. You can say exactly as Paul did. He's not any more spiritual than you and I are. He's not any more brilliant, gifted, talent, or loved than you and I are. But when he can say, man, I am torn... Because for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That means to live is Christ, it's anointed work, but it's suffering, it's persecution, it's toil. And to do the work of Christ, he's pleased with, but for him to die is gain. Why? He said, it is far better for me to be with the Lord. 
He wanted to glorify the Lord, whether in the body or apart from the body. But he clearly knew what I clearly know and what you should clearly know. And that is to be away from the body is to be present with the Lord. When you know him, you want to be with him. My friend, all this work, even if God does this with hundreds of thousands of people, this is the truth what I'm telling you from my heart. If God does what he's doing now with a few thousand people, if by the time my life is over, it's a hundred thousand people. I have no desire in heaven for any reward other than this. I've told the Father this. If I can be the guy at the back of the line and he just gives me enough room to see him, that is good enough for me. I just want to be able to look at him. I don't care if I have to do it from the back of the room. I've asked him if I could follow him around and wash his feet. That comes from my heart, my friend, not something I've worked up in my head. Not something I say so that you can say, wow, what spirituality, what humility. No, I'm sharing with you a piece of my heart that I've shared with my Father. This is what Father can do for you in your heart. This is how He can keep you and free you from the world and the ways and the concerns and the frets and the schemes and the pursuits of men, godless, heathenistic men. He can make it to where your greatest desire, you talk about Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Look how much he's changed the desires of my heart. I used to want to be king of the world. Now I want to be a foot washer. Now I just want to be the guy at the back of the line who gets to say, I see him. I see him. He's there. Do you see him? I can see him. That is my desire. That is the delight of my heart. My friend, there's only so much time. What are you weighed down? Relationships. People, recreations, activities, worries, get rid of it. Get off of Facebook. And if you if you have to be on Facebook just to find something godly, get rid of all of your friends who want to tell you about all the things that are going on in your life. I'm going to tell you the truth. Thomas Akempis said it best. You are never going to find peace in this life when you are concerning yourself with the affairs and the wares of other men. If you're constantly, even their latest vacation, even their latest this, their latest that, those are the affairs of men. What does that have to do with you becoming more like Jesus Christ? Be wise, my friend. Count the days, for they are evil. Be wise. Get rid of all these things that don't have anything to do with helping you to delight yourself in the Lord and to become more like Jesus Christ. May God help you. May God show you things that are permissible but not beneficial. Permissible but not constructive. They're not doing anything to help you become more like Jesus or those around you. They may give you a little hit like a Lay's potato chip or a little hit of sugar. But it's poison. It distracts you and it robs you. And it will be these very things. Maybe even things that are not seen as evil in the eyes of the world. But it will be these things that you stand before the Lord Jesus Christ with regret and say, man, if I would have only taken those two hours a day or two hours a week or however many hours it is that I invested in this thing in the world that I thought was okay, that nobody said was wrong, if I would have just put that more into finding my Lord, I could have been more full, I could have been more useful, there would be more people standing to my left and to my right because of me. I'm not saying that you can't have any kind of recreation I'm not saying you can't have any kind of fun or interest outside of God. But I am telling you that if you are truly finding God, you will find having anything outside of Him to become increasingly difficult and possibly even unbearable. I, I, I have lost the desire. And again, I'm not saying these things to put you down if you don't or to proclaim self-righteousness. Not at all. I'm trying to testify to you that you can know God. Like for example, right now there's guys out here on these uh, sedus. Okay, I can remember in my life when I would saw one of those things and been so enamored. I, I grew up in Cocoa Beach and I rode some of the very first jet skis that were made right there in the ocean. And even as an adult, when I was working hard and married with kids driving down the road, I'd see people out on those things and go, man, I'd give anything to be out there on that. The desire was so strong. Now I look at this and I go, wow, look at this, the pleasures of the world. These people are out here squandering their life. What for? How is this person right here passing me on this sea going to be any more like Jesus Christ 
What is this person going to think when they have to stand before Jesus Christ right here and give an account for their life, how they lived? They think that what they're doing right now is so important. And it's given them so much pleasure. And I know I was there. I remember when it would give me that kind of pleasure. But what is it going to do for them when they have to stand before Jesus Christ? What are the things that you are finding enjoyment and pleasure in going to do for you when you have to stand before Jesus Christ and give an account of your life? Remember, the Bible says in Luke 16, 15, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men. But God knows your hearts. And what is highly valued among men is detestable in God's eyes. It took me years for to have spiritual sight to see this, okay? And God did not condemn me when I was in my ignorance, loving these kind of things that these people are out here today loving. He didn't condemn me for my ignorance, and He doesn't condemn you for your ignorance, and He doesn't condemn this person for their ignorance. Perhaps they'll have light one day. These are the ways of men, but God calls us to turn from these ways. And you're getting light from me. You're hearing me tell you and to testify of the truth. You have an opportunity, as I tell one man who I've been discipling for a year and a half, one of my dearest favorite brothers, Jared. I've told him from the very beginning, if he'll listen to what I'm telling him out of the Word of God, that I can prove to him his truth through my own experience, I've told him multiple times, you will be ahead of me. You can be farther ahead than where I'm at at my age because I'm older than him. And I'm already seeing evidence. God has been pleased to bless this man such that he is already, in many ways, farther ahead in his journey at the time he is, right now in his journey, than when I was in the same amount of journey time that he was. He's already ahead. I pray that that is what happens for you. That's why I make these recordings, is to encourage you from real world faith. In my own life, I have done what Jesus Christ told me to do. I put God's word to the test, as he says in John 7:17, 7, and I found out. I haven't found out all, but that which I do know, I share with you. And I pray in God's beautiful Son, Jesus Christ's name, who loves you and gave himself for you and died for you, that you'll live for him in and through his ways, his truth, and his teachings. What can you give up as a living sacrifice today, Romans 12, 1, to make more room for Christ Jesus in your heart and your life? And my friend, as you give thought to this today, do so in light of the words of the great Leonard Ravenhill, who used to preach to audiences everywhere that entertainment is the devil's substitute for a real relationship with God. And I just have been thanking the Father so much this morning for the peace that is in my heart by Jesus Christ and realizing how much He has kept me through. So many storms, so many adversities, so many difficulties, and yet I can look back and see that even in some of the most terrifying times where I took my eyes off of Him and His promises, and I slipped in my faith a little bit, once I put my eyes back on Him through my spiritual disciplines and clinging to the Word of God and crying out to Him in prayer, I see that Father has kept a sea of glass, tranquility in my heart through so many of these difficulties. And peace is something that is so vital to the Christian life. It's something that is one of the richest blessings God can give us. And yet, it is one of the most MIA, missing in action attributes of the Christian life. So I wanted to just share a little bit about what's on my heart as it relates to how we as Christ followers can find more peace. So the Bible says a lot of wonderful things about peace. And Jesus in John 14, 27 promised, he said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. The word steadfast means unwavering, fixed, okay? It's something that is 
determined. It's not moving to the left or to the right. It's not e easily distracted and it's not easily taken off course. And this is one of the things that God has taught me how to do. And without a doubt, I want to make it clear that the only peace that we can count on is the peace that comes from God. I'm not, again, trying to tell you how you can work up some worldly peace. The real peace comes from the Lord Jesus Christ as a gift through our love of Him as evidenced by obedience to His words and our believing in faith that He has these good things for us. But there are principles that we can practice, ways of wisdom, ways of the Lord, that will help us supplement that peace that Jesus Christ gives us. I personally believe we're living in some of the most difficult times there ever has been to be a true follower of Jesus Christ. I believe um, there are so many more distractions and there are now 2,000 years worth of the devil's schemes. You know, the devil has been learning right along with the best of God's people, but he never goes to the grave. He's an eternal. I do not give as the world gives. The peace that the world gives is determined by circumstances. Even the darkest hearted heathen can experience peace if his circumstances are in order and things are going well in his life. And then when you take away those difficult circumstances, his heart becomes a reflection of those circumstances. I can think of the few bosses I had who their peace was determined by the stock ticker. Each day they watched the stock market and their peace, their happiness was determined and would correlate directly to the ups and downs of the stock market. That's an example of peace that comes from the world. Um, relationships. I used to have a peace that if my ex-wife was doing good, I was doing good. If she was doing bad, I was doing bad. She was my stock ticker. And so that's the way that the world gives peace. And this is not what God holds in store for His children. Praise be to the Father in heaven. There's a much, much better way. I testify to you that even in suffering, I now walk in a peace that is unlike anything I have ever imagined that no matter what I may be experiencing in my body, physical pain, in my mind, torments, emotional... This is what Father can do for you in your heart. This is how He can keep you and free you from the world and the ways and the concerns and the frets and the schemes and the pursuits of men, godless, heathenistic men. He can make it to where your greatest desire... You talk about Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Look how much He's changed the desires of my heart. I used to want to be king of the world. Now I want to be a foot washer. Now I just want to be the guy at the back of the line who gets to say, I see him. I see him. He's there. Do you see him? I can see him. That is my desire. That is the delight of my heart. It is 8.42 in the morning on July 23rd, 2017. I've been driving this morning to my favorite walking trail next to the Tennessee River. And I just love the sound of the cicada bugs in the summertime when they come. I just love that sound. I hope you're not distracted by it. It's something I, it reminds me of when I was a kid playing in the front yard at my grandmother's house. The 17 year cicada bug, they would come out and be so noisy and they're apparently around this year so I on my way here was thinking about the topic of peace whatever it is even spiritual oppression and torments from the devil because he hates me so much inside my heart as the Tennessee River is a plate of glass this morning so it is inside my heart it is truly a gift and in Isaiah 26, 3, I believe it is, God tells us that, and this is a promise that we can cash in the bank of heaven through faith and humble dependence and obedience to God's words through Christ Jesus. He says, He will keep him in perfect peace 
whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in him. Now, one of the things I want to talk about is the not so obvious part of being steadfast. When we think of that verse, we have a tendency to think that means if I trust God in all things, everything's going to go well. That's absolutely true, but there's other parts of this that I see in my own life that I want to share with you that are principles that have contributed to the peace that I enjoy and I testify to on my YouTube channel. And that is, I live a very simple life. The word